Hey guys, Dan here over Zoom. We've got Tim. Hello, Tim. Hi, everybody. Well, let's get Dan. Yeah, let's man. Go. We've got uh, part of and part of the uh, Disney afternoon. Yes, that's why he was in that movie. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we've got uh, the Incredible Journey, uh, sure which which actually, speaking of Darkwing Duck, harkens to another '90s Disney property. Yeah. Uh, um, the Homeward Bound. Yeah, Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. Um, so we'll we'll get to that in many, many years, I guess. But that's from 1993 with Michael J. Fox and Sally Field uh, providing voices. But this was the original version of that, um, which I'm not sure I realized w existed. I don't I mean, I never saw The Incredible Journey, uh, Homeward Bound either, but I was aware of its existence. Did you know this one uh, existed before we started uh, doing this? Pr prior to us doing this, I don't think so. I didn't think it was a remake. OK, yeah. Um, I think many people will be shocked about that, but maybe because of that connection, this one is one of the few that's available uh, from the 60s on Disney Plus. So you can watch it for free there. Uh, or, of course, if you don't have that, you can also rent it from all the usual suspects. Um, so this was the big Thanksgiving release, November 20th, 1963, which means I guess there's only one more for the year, right? The Christmas movie. Yeah. And that's uh, the animated feature uh, Sword and Stone. Oh, that's right. That's of course. Yeah. How could I forget? Um, so this uh, did all right. Uh, I have no uh, budget for this, like a lot of these 60s live action, but uh, it made 4.2 million at the box office. So a pretty big hit at the time. It's based on the 1961 novel of the same name by uh, Sheila Bunford or Burnford. Um, and then, of course, we talked about the remake. Um, and this first came to home video in 1984. It was re-released again in 94 obviously is sort of a, a tie-in with that new version um probably just being released on vhs around the same time um i don't have a ton of background on this um i do know that it was filmed mostly in washington and oregon um the indoor scenes and a few of the flyover things uh that we see are from ontario but for the most part this was filmed in oregon uh disney took a lot of his uh old crew that did some of the the nature documentaries and some of the more recent um animal movies and they did a lot of the cinematography for this um the biggest background thing i found on this is that oliver wallace who was a longtime disney composer from the 30s this was his last disney movie he died two months before this one got released um and we don't usually talk about the orchestral music um but tim this guy did over 20 disney features uh, either in their entirety or contributed to, uh, including Dumbo, which he won an Oscar for, um, Old Yeller, Darby O'Gill, um, Alice in Wonderland, and uh, one of our favorites, the Martins and the Coys segment of Make Mine Music. Yeah, um, you also didn't mention Cinderella and Peter Pan were two of his other ones. Yes, um, and those were ones I think he did more partial. Um, I don't, okay. or maybe he, right? I think, I think... Because uh, there were a handful, like Lady and the Tramp was another one that he, like, I think contributed one piece to, but he didn't do the full score. I think Peter Pan was score and songs. I think. Oh, had, okay. Um, and then Cinderella was score. I know Lady and the Tramp was partial. So okay, yeah, and I mean, I mean, he did many, many, many that uh, we also didn't mention. Third Man on the Mountain, and you know, some of the ones that you and I have gone over uh, from the live action canon. But yeah, I mean, very prolific dude. Um, I don't know if he's a Disney legend. I would feel like he should be if he won an oscar for doing uh dumbo but um but yeah he passed on uh just two months before this got released so this ended up being his final uh contribution yeah and that's really all i have i mean I, you know um I, tim's gonna tell us about the people but this is mostly uh, about the dogs so there's a few uh, names we're gonna recognize but not many yeah so, uh, like Dan said, uh, Incredible Journey is based off the 1961 novel of the same name by uh, a British-Canadian author, um, she uh, Sheila Burnford. Um, and it is the story of three pets, um, a Labrador retriever named uh, Luath, um, a bull terrier named Bodger, and a Siamese cat named Teo. Um, and as they journey 250 miles of the Canadian wilderness to return home, on their adventure, they encounter raging rivers, uh, dangerous animals like bears, mountain lions, and uh, porcupines. Um, they are 
very dangerous animals. Um, and they also come across a few humans that aid them on their incredible journey. And that is the, the basis plot. Um, cast wise, we have Emil uh, Genest. We've seen him a couple times in this movie. He plays John Longridge and he's basically the person, basically he's pet sitting for these pets, like while the family's away. And then he leaves and then the animals start their incredible journey. And he's like on a hunting trip for a couple of weeks and the caretaker didn't realize that the pets weren't with them, blah, blah, blah. Um, similar story of how the, the first one happens. Um, uh, we've seen him twice before. He was in Big Red and then he was, I think the main villain in Nicky Wild Dog of the North. Um, so he has a little bit of range because that villain was uh, really bad. Um, yeah, and, and, but, but all, the, all the dog movies. Yeah, dog movies. Um, he does do one other Disney thing. It's not a movie after this. It's a, a magical world Disney two-part movie called uh, Kit Carson and the Mountain Men. And that's in 77. Um, and he is uh, French-Canadian. That's why uh, Big Red and Mickey Wild Dark, Dog of the North are, those were the, the French-Canadian movies. So he was in those as well. Um, but fun fact, he did not dub himself for the French version of this one. And I think he did do that in the other ones. Um, if I remember correctly, and at then the, least the one I, I don't remember if we talked about it in the other one, but yeah, at least in, I think Nikki dog of the North. Yeah. Um, and then the only other person I have, have written down here because there are many humans that they meet, but I couldn't find any of them as returning characters or having like a significant role in any other movies. Um, we have Rex Allen. He is the narrator in this. We last heard his voice as the narrator in legend of Lobo in 62. And we'll next Hear his voice, I believe, again, as the narrator of um, Charlie and the Lonesome uh, Cougar. I think that's his last Disney movie, but he's done a lot of other shorts and other magical world of Disney, like narrations and things like that. Um, but we mentioned last time he is most famously for being part of the Carousel of Progress and uh, being in the, the song. Uh, that's a great big, beautiful tomorrow at Disney World. Um, yeah, the original. The original. Um, he has a minor part in the new ride. Um, and then uh, James Algarl, um, he we know him from True Life Adventures and many of these other um, movies that require a lot of nature shooting and things like that, like The Ten Who Dared. They usually brought him back on for that. But he has a screenplay credit and he's a producer for this. It makes sense. They're in the wilderness. Uh, he knows the wilderness. Um, and that's the only other person I wrote down. Um, we mentioned the 1993 remake of Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. Um, there's some differences here. Um, this movie- You've is, seen Homeward Bound. Yes. So, and I've seen it. I enjoyed it growing up. Um, in that one, you have, it's a weird movie because you have talking animals, but it's not the talking animals where their mouth's smooth. You just hear, like, it's like, Michael J. Fox has a funny line and it's just understood that all the other animals can understand what he says. The humans can't. Um, yeah, it's I, like a Garfield. Um, I guess when the dark in Garfield, his mouth moves with the, the thing, the dog, the cat's mouth moves. This one, the dog, it does mouth, like the animated Bill Murray one. Oh no. The, the real thing, the, you, the animated movie. Uh, it's just his inner thoughts and the other animals can hear him, but John and the other humans don't hear him. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, you know what? I, I forgot about the Bill Murray one. I don't know what they did in that. Oh. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was bad. Yeah. So uh, that's the big difference is that this one, you don't really have the animals motivations. Like you just have kind of like this narrow telling them a little bit. But in the other one, you kind of under feel more for the animals because they have uh, conversations with each other. They, they have this bond that you feel for each other. Um, but also you have, besides Michael J. Fox, you have Sally Field, and then you have um, Don Amici. He does the voice Amici, of Shadow. Yeah. Shadow. He only did it in the first one, Homeward Bound. There is a 1996 sequel called Homeward Bound 2, Lost in San Francisco. Um, he passed away sh shortly before the release of Homeward Bound, um, so they replaced him with Ralph uh, uh, Waitie. Um, but they changed, they changed the, the animals for the most part. Um, 
Chance was the name of the Bull Terry. Well, he wasn't Bull Terry. He went from Bull Terry to American Bulldog in this in the remake, and his name got changed to Chase. Teo, the cat, I think he was still a Siamese cat, um, but got changed to Sassy and got changed to a female. Um, and then uh, Leoth um, uh, got changed to Shadow and from a Labrador Retriever to a Golden Retriever. Um, well, the names are horrible. The names are one of the worst parts of the movie. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, you know, they're just so irritating. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I imagine they are, I don't know, they're, they're, they're Canadian names, I guess. I don't know. It's based off a Canadian book. It was filmed in I guess. Some of Canada, so it made sense. Are they the same names from the book, do you know? I think so, yeah. All right, well, they're lousy names, and uh, it was annoying. Yeah, I mean, I like I like Chance, Shadow, and Sassy so much better. I mean, I thought Teo was okay. Teo Cat was fine. Um, it was yeah. the, the Bodger and the... Luau. Bodger, I mean, Bodger is such a dumb name. There's a word badger, but well, like and, bo- it's like they're combining badger and like Dodger or something. Yeah. And it reminds me of Dodger from like um Oliver and Company. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of that. I just was thinking like the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah. Um, I also wrote down that uh 2006 AFI's 100 Years, 100 Cheers that's got nominated for that. I don't think got on there. Um, each yeah, animal- I think they, they nominated about 500 movies, so this yeah. was just one of the nominations that yeah. didn't make it, but I so mean, good. it makes sense, yeah. Um, each animal had their own personal animal handler, handler. Um, and then uh, Sheila Burnfield at did spend seven days, um, with the, with the film crew, and she was on set while the, the cat was uh, fishing for the fish, um, and that cat would catch a fish every single time as many times as the director wanted to so um they were very talented animals yeah uh, i mean i i like the animals a lot obviously you know this was before uh the, the days of the cgi and they were all real animals doing real things um there were some scenes of some legitimate peril i mean when the when the big bear was uh, on the scene uh, that was a little bit unnerving yeah, and the, the the river scene was uh, unnerving for the cat as well. Mm-hmm. I think where this movie shines is with the animals. The animals are great, um, and then um, it is a little bit lacking with some of the human scenes. Uh, some of the humans do give good performances. Some of them okay performances. But usually the problem is that when you have a human, it just takes you away from the animals, and that's what you signed up when you went to this movie is you wanted animals and uh, I feel like the pacing kind of slows down. Everything kind of like stops when the humans are involved and uh, it gets better when the animals just by themselves. Animal yeah. Fight. And and this is not a long movie. It's like 80 minutes and uh, probably a good, uh, maybe 20 is with random humans and adults and, and stuff um so it definitely cuts down you know it's almost probably a third of the movie yeah and like i didn't mind the beginning humans and like because it had set up the plot like the beginning humans were fine right. um and then the ending humans were fine it's the same family but like the emotional payoff it definitely it, it's there um because the the little kids really like their animals so you get that um and the the guy that uh, Emil Jess, uh, John Longbridge, who was babies, uh, pet sitting for them. He felt bad and it made sense for him as well. But all the other humans in the middle are just, uh, kind of like, I can go without it. They, yeah, they brought it down for sure. I mean, right. Like you said, what people signed up for, I think is the, the animal adventures. And this is, you know, it makes sense that the true life adventures people were sort of having a hand in that. And James Algar specifically, and, um, because a lot of the scenes do feel very sort of true life adventure Um, if it wasn't that we knew it was written, I think you, you could say, okay, well, you know, some of this maybe is how they would, they would act in nature. Obviously they're throwing animals together, you know, bears and cats aren't usually hanging out together, but, um, but it, in just sort of the, um, the scenes with just the main characters, I feel like we do get kind of a sense of, okay, well, even though this is scripted, I sort of, I believed that they were friends or, you know, or whatever. 
Yeah, and I feel like this is kind of what they were trying to do with the Legend of Lobo. Like they had yeah. Rex narrator, but they kind of were like barring a little bit too much from the true life adventure in the first half. And the second half was kind of more like this, where it was like kind of story ish and narrative and it made sense, but it didn't fit with the first half. And the first half was a little bit better where I feel like this was the whole thing was the second half of Lobo it made sense. It was narrative. You don't think this is an educator short whatsoever. Um, this kind of like reminded me, it actually reminded me a little bit of Milo and Otis growing up. Mm. Um, that also, Another one I didn't say. That didn't have talking animals. That also had a narrator talking about the dog and the cat type of thing. I don't mind necessarily uh, when the animals talk, as long as right, when the mouths move, that's when I, I don't like it. But um, but I, I thought the narrator was used way too much in this movie. Yeah. I think, Right. Like there, yeah. there should have been times when he sort of hung back and just let the animals sort of speak for themselves. Um, the way I feel like they do in the true life adventures, a lot of times they'll, they'll sort of set it up. Okay. You know, this, this snail is doing whatever. And then for, you know, a minute and a half, we just watch the snail do its thing or whatever. Um, I feel like we could have used more of those sort of moments. Cause I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's weird to say like the the acting was good from the animals, but I mean, I, I feel like the animals gave us sort of very natural performances, and I I think the narrator was just utilized way too much. Yeah. So. Um, I do think uh, every time the animals are on the screen, like the the scenery is beautiful, the all the nature stuff is really done well. Yeah. So it makes sense that you have James Algar here doing his thing. Um, I just wish that the, 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 the scenes with some of the, the humans in the middle, um, I guess I wanted more of their performances because the things that happened with the humans were somewhere important. Like the one family like saves the cat and the one fa- one guy takes the porcupine pill uh, quills out of the, the dog. Like it's important things to the story, but like it just felt, I don't know, a little bit was missing with those scenes. Well, the acting wasn't great. You mentioned, you know, some of them gave decent performances, some of them not so much. Uh, yeah, I definitely am more on the side of like a lot of these people gave us pretty subpar performances and it makes sense. We don't know them. They've not been in previous Disney stuff. We don't see them again in other Disney things. I, I feel like, uh, you know, maybe uh, they they weren't giving the performances that Walt and the crew had hoped for. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I agree that that stuff all dragged it down, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the actual animal stuff, the adventure part of the story, um, it was definitely, you know, good and, and riveting at some parts. Um, but yeah, they definitely needed to take some steps back from both the narration and just the, the human factor in general. But I do agree. Some of the shots they were getting were really good. Um, you know, the, this crew knows it's, it's nature stuff and um, some of the overhead scenes where they actually were in Canada, you know, were, were pretty cool looking. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew this would, uh, was going to be a pretty short one. There's, there's not a ton to say really other than the, uh, the, the bad, uh, human acting, but, um, yeah, well, I mean, I, all the positives. I agree. Like it, it's Lobo, but only kind of the good stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the only other thing I've read was that I think they wanted to film a lot of it in Canada, but the season was just too short. So they did some filming around uh, Sheila Byrne uh, Ford's actual house in Ontario. Um, but the season was just too short to get all the filming in. So they, that's why they moved it a little bit to the U.S. Yeah, and, uh, you know, honestly, that doesn't bother me. I mean, look, when you think about the one with the, uh, the what was it, Perry the Squirrel, where it was like, half done on a sound stage i mean at least they were outside in nature you know in that part of the world uh you know washington's pretty washington oregon pretty close to the canadian climate i feel like in in the winter time yeah and that they weren't it's not like this is educational at all like there was no educational right whatsoever so it, it makes sense yeah yeah agreed um yeah so for me this is actually one of the better ones that we've seen in a while. It's still not great. I mean, it's not up there with uh, some some of the best, but it's the first like definitively positive grade I feel like I've given in several movies. Oh yeah, right. 
I'm I'm gonna leave this with a B minus. Okay. Um, I was actually gonna give it a C plus because of wow, Tim. Um, and I think usually I'm I'm a lower. No, but I think also I'm probably biased because uh, as a kid I enjoyed the remake. Um, yeah, that but, is true. I I can't compare it to the '93 version, so that definitely could be a factor. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't hate a C plus. Yeah, I will, but I'll 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 grade it for what it is and not my bias. And I'll, I'll agree with you, B minus. Uh, yeah, I like like all these movies. I do feel like we have to think about the you know where they were in time. Yeah. Obviously, there's you know probably some animal ethics uh, things that wouldn't go on today in this movie but um but yeah i feel like especially with the the just lacking of good animal disney movies lately i mean we've seen so many that are just in that like c c minus kind of range bad stories or or you know in the case of lobo you know the second half is great um so I, I think this this probably gave people enough of what they wanted from a Disney uh, animal movie. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I'll go with B-. minus. All right. B minus it is then. It's official. All right. So next is, is Sword in the Stone. Um, I guess I'll figure out with Joe uh, what's going on with that. Maybe we can uh, make that a triple like we did with um, Song of the South. Um, okay. But uh, in any event, in 64, we have... Uh, one of my all-time favorite movies, not just Disney's, but uh, the Mary Poppins. Yeah, but that's uh, about... That's a while away, because that was their Christmas movie, I think, right? I think so. I think it was their summer, wasn't it? Their that summer? summer? Okay, maybe it was. Maybe, the maybe Returns I'm... was Christmas, so maybe I was thinking of that. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's, um, it's, there's seven movies in 64. And one of them is the Poppins. What's our Haley Mills? She finally gets her kiss. Yes, that is Moon Spinners. The Moon Spinners, yes. And you told me uh, off air yesterday that uh, your your wife and her family were going to watch that. Did they end up doing that? They did. Um, uh, early yeah. review? Early review. They, they enjoyed it. Um, so uh, okay. we'll see what I think about it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll the, have to check it out. The first one might be it's either Three Lives of Thomasina. I, I was thinking Thomasina. Or Tiger Walks. One of those two, I okay. think. We've well, talked about Thomasina so much, it's always on my mind. Yeah, and so we've mentioned uh, Tiger Walks a couple of times because uh, I think Kevin McCorker and uh, Keith, uh, Brian Keith are in but that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. I After Savage Sam, I don't know if I could take that kid much much more, Kevin Corcoran. Yeah, I don't know how many more we have of him. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. hopefully, hopefully it's dwindling at this point. I liked him for a little while, but yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, anyway, Tim, thank you for joining and uh, we'll see everybody next time on Dan Does Disney. Bye. Bye, everybody.